seems to say that coffee, even in large amounts, doesn't adversely affect blood sugar. For me, it seems that caffeinated coffee in the morning causes slightly elevated blood sugar for the rest of the day. Well, I believe it because I've treated many patients, many who uh, drink a little bit of coffee, some who drink a lot of coffee, and what I see is that for some people, if there's no added uh, uh, sugar or cream or milk, they have no effect upon their blood sugar, and others have a substantial effect on their blood sugar. So uh, uh, it's not what you're going to find out on the Internet. Uh, it's going to vary with the individual. I remember when I was in medical school, I was uh, taught about glucagon by uh, Aura Rosen, who uh, subsequently discovered the um, chemical structure of the insulin receptor. And she told us that uh, the, the alpha cells in the pancreas that make glucagon are stimulated by caffeine. And if you drink caffeine uh, uh, or eat caffeine, you're going to uh, stimulate glucagon production and raise your blood sugar. And I believe that until... Uh, I started experimenting on myself, and I found that uh, the coffee didn't seem to have any effect. But when I went out in practice, I found that for many patients, it had significant effect. And I don't know how to predict which patients are going to respond to the coffee with high blood sugars and which are not. But I believe what this lady says in her question. Next question. My new doctor says my diabetes is, <laughs> is too controlled with an A1C of 6%. I am 68 years old. He says it should be above 7 for older people. Is this true? Well, actually, as, as I recall, and I could be wrong, the ADA, American Diabetes Association, uh, recommends over 8% for older people. The reason they give is that these people are not going to live uh, very long anyway. They uh, may not die of complications of diabetes. They're probably near death anyway. So why deprive them of the sweet foods and things that could make life enjoyable? Uh, uh, just let them go down the tubes. That's, uh, in effect, the attitude that um, uh, seems to appear in the guidelines. But if you uh, speak to some of the people that were originally involved in these high carbohydrate gu guidelines many years ago, as I did before I became a physician, uh, they're worried about hypoglycemia. And I've stated this experience over and over. I'm told, hey, I'm a doctor, I, I specialize in diabetes, I treat several thousand diabetic patients. If they all uh, die of congestive heart failure or go blind or have their legs amputated, those are natural consequences of the disease. So uh, I'm not responsible if high blood sugars uh, kill them uh, slowly. But if one patient dies of hypoglycemia, I get sued. Well, in modern years, there's even an additional factor to take into consideration. Let's say that a doctor is treating an older patient. The patient dies of hypoglycemia, but he's told the patient, you have to keep your blood sugars well, an A1C of 8 would be um, uh, to above 280. Um, no, I'm sorry, above 220. Uh, and this patient dies of hypoglycemia. The doctor can say, I 
my chart notes show that I was practicing in accord with the ADA guidelines. I told him his blood sugars have to be above 220, his A1C has to be above 8, so I was in accord with the guidelines. And in most courts in this country, if you stuck to the guidelines, you can't be sued. So even though he died of hypoglycemia, um, I can't be sued uh, because I was sticking to the guidelines. That's sort of the ball game. And if your doctor is trying to do this sort of thing to you, uh, you should find a doctor who's more sympathetic and who uh, uh, would place a greater value on your survival. Do you see a connection between increased cortisol production in the body and elevated glucose levels in type 2 insulin resistant diabetes? Well, there, there is a disease called Cushing syndrome where people make too much cortisol. Although I've seen thousands of patients, both in my uh, private practice and in clinic, um, I cannot offhand recall one patient with Cushing syndrome. Maybe I saw one somewhere back there, but this is very rare. And uh, uh, cortisol can raise blood sugars. I've had patients who uh, were given uh, prednisone pills, which is sort of equivalent to having a high cortisol, and their blood sugars uh, uh, went uh, very high, depending upon the dose of the prednisone. Uh, when I had a uh, frozen shoulder uh, some 50 years ago, uh, an orthopedic surgeon injected uh, cortisone into my shoulder and my blood and uh, I think that that may have been uh, maybe it was 40 years ago just after I got my first meter and my blood sugars were high for two months and I've seen other people who receive uh, steroid injections having high blood sugars for periods of months again from cortisol so if you give cortisol, you have to be prepared to give more insulin if the cortisol is really necessary. Now, in my case, for the frozen shoulder, that made it temporarily feel better and later uh, made it get worse. Uh, the treatment for frozen shoulder is trigger point massage, not injecting with steroids. And many of these orthopedic procedures of injecting steroids are not effective, uh, but some of them are. So uh, uh, it's highly variable upon uh, what treatment's going to work and what isn't. Uh, in any event, cortisol raises blood sugar. What is the upper limit of fat intake in diet? In last three weeks, I have swelling in my feet. Can this be caused by high fat? I'm 74 years old. Diet includes 50 grams of carbohydrate per meal. So first of all, I'd suggest that you uh, read my book and start uh, improving your blood sugars because 50 grams of carb are going to send your blood sugars sky high and there's no medication that can control them in a predictable fashion. But the swelling of the feet is not due to uh, three weeks of fat. Um, it could be due to uh, chronic venous insufficiency, but for that to affect both feet simultaneously out of the blue is, would be very strange. Um, uh, possibly if you had been on a 20-hour uh, uh, or 12-hour airplane ride for, uh, uh, in that period of time, remote possibility, but I would doubt it. Uh, what else can cause swelling of the feet? Certain medications can. So if you are taking uh, one of the thiazolidine dione drugs, you could cause swelling in the feet. If you have CVID, you could cause, uh, and you have uh, an immune deficiency, not enough immunoglobulins, 
that would mean that your total serum protein is diminished. And indeed, uh, uh, three weeks after your last infusion, when your blood levels of immunoglobulins are low, your feet could swell up. And then after the next infusion, when your serum proteins are restored, your swelling might go down. Uh, but then three weeks later, uh, it could go up again. But you didn't mention whether or not you have CVID and are getting infusions. So um, it's hard, hard to tell what would cause this. There's a condition, condition called myxedema uh, when thyroid is very low, uh, but, the, but myxedema comes on slowly. It doesn't all of a sudden appear, and hypothyroidism uh, doesn't uh, appear all of a sudden unless you've had thyroid surgery or radiation or certain drugs, etc. Uh, yeah, there is a drug that called amiodarone that perhaps can have an effect, a more rapid effect. Uh, so uh, it's hard for me to tell. Uh, pancreatitis uh, can cause serum protein loss and swelling, but you'd have other symptoms. You'd have gastrointestinal symptoms. So uh, you have an interesting problem. I wish I could figure it out. I gave you a few ideas, but you probably uh, uh, should see uh, a, a very wise physician because there are so many possibilities that you may, you may have to consult several specialists before you find the one who figures out what the problem is. <clears throat> My 16-year-old daughter plays varsity sports. She becomes shaky and nauseous in the middle of lacrosse games. I checked her blood sugar was 180 milligrams per deciliter. Fasting glucose is 83. Is, she, is this a beginning sign of diabetes? Boy, it surely looks suspicious to me. Now, the first thing I would do is check your meter because there are so many grossly inaccurate meters on the market uh, that the error could be in the meter. But if she's consistent, consistently going up during the lacrosse games, uh, this is most suspicious. First of all, I'd say uh, get uh, the most accurate meter you could find. Right now, the two meters that look good are the... Um, Abbott Freestyle, actually three meters, Freestyle Freedom, Freestyle Freedom Light, and we've had some su success now around the normal range with the Contour Next. Um, I wouldn't use any other meters. We've seen uh, meters that give you two successive readings from the same finger stick that are 100 milligrams per deciliter apart. So there are a lot of worthless meters out there. Now, so if she's really going up, chances are she is diabetic. You could check her hemoglobin A1C as a, as a uh, cross-check. Um, if uh, this is a 16-year-old person uh, and her A1C is over 5%, uh, there's a good chance that uh, she already has some sort of impairment of glucose tolerance. And of course, if she's over 6%, uh, you can be sure she's diabetic. Um, that's about all I can tell you. I'm 42 years old, diagnosed type 1 at age 26. I use an insulin pump. I also have palindromic rheumatism. Palindromic means that it comes and goes, comes, disappears, and reappears at random. I know that both conditions are autoimmune diseases. Is there any way I can reverse these conditions or lower my chances of getting another autoimmune disease? I really don't know. Um, most autoimmune diseases seem to involve some degree of inflammation and usually are associated with 
a, a, a number of inflammatory markers that can be measured in the blood. Trouble is, uh, you can't predict which ones a given person is going to have. I recently had some experience, by recently I mean within the past uh, four days, uh, that might or might not be pertinent. Uh, my daughter has a 15-year-old dog uh, who has osteoarthritis. And a few years ago, the veterinarian uh, prescribed a pill that cost something like $128 a month. So I said to my daughter, uh, let's try some fish oil first. It's a lot cheaper. <laughs> so she tried some fish oil and it worked. And uh, for a, a few years, it was doing fine, but the dog did not like the fish oil. And my daughter went about a year ago to a health food store and said, what can I use instead of the fish oil? And they gave her a product. Uh, the product was a very uh, potent dose of curcumin, the, sp the uh, spice. Uh, and the brand name is Cura, C-U-R-A, Med, M-E-D. Cura Med. Um, it's called Superior Absorption Curcumin. And whammo, this stuff stopped each arthritis attack. And the dog comes up to her and nudges her when she wants a pill. <laughs> and uh, this has been going on for a year. So uh, my sidekick, Samantha, has rheumatoid arthritis and can be extremely painful. And her hands swell up so much that her, she can't get her rings off. So when we heard the story about uh, my daughter's dog, we immediately got uh, some Curamed for Samantha. And she tried it at the start of an attack and the pain went away, the swelling went down, the rings came right off. And she's now been doing that every time she gets an attack for uh, uh, the past four or five days. Um, and it's miraculous. Um, my wife tore a ligament in her ankle and was in chronic pain that waxes and wanes during the day, uh, gets worse at night, probably because your cortisol levels are lower at night and cortisone is anti-inflammatory. So I gave her some of this stuff at night and it stopped her pain. Uh, but then it came back a number of hours later. So maybe by trying to chronically fight inflammation, something like this could be a value, but uh, I don't know. It could be that if you use something like this chronically, uh, other systems can uh, be impaired. But I thought this was in interesting enough to talk about, and I really don't know how to universally prevent autoimmune disorders. Next question. What do you think about all the positive talk about coconut oil? Should it be included in the diabetic's diet? Um, there's been pros and cons talk uh, uh, about coconut oil. It has a trans fat that supposedly has some benefits to it, maybe a cardiovascular benefits. I believe it's uh, palmitolinolenic acid um, on the one hand. On the other hand, there have been comments in various journal articles criticizing coconut oil. I saw a recent criticism of coconut oil in Consumer Reports. Um, I think that if you have diet, and the question is, uh, should this be included in the diabetic's diet? Looking for magical things outside of blood sugar control is sort of spinning your wheels and wasting time, I think. Um, the people who do the best are the people with normal blood sugars. I've not seen 
Well, I've, I've seen only one case of benefit from a supplement uh, that I could attest to and say I actually saw this. Uh, that was the uh, case of the lady who couldn't control her overeating and had chronically high blood sugars in spite of taking insulin. And when she took uh, vanadyl sulfate, her average blood sugar went down considerably and was much more stable. But there are uh, potential hazards of vanadyl sulfate that are great enough that I will not prescribe it uh, to my patients. So uh, there really are no magical things for the diabetes itself. Uh, there are treatments for complications that sometimes work, but not nearly as good as normalizing blood sugars. And we've seen tremendous improvements in the neuropathies uh, merely by normalizing blood sugar. A lot of long-term type 1 diabetics are suffering with insulin resistance. We don't know what to do. Most of us can't lose weight. Well, first of all, you should read the book Diabetes Solution. Uh, the key is a low carbohydrate diet, but it's also a lot of other things that uh, we describe in the book. Um, I have one patient who we put on a low carbohydrate diet. She lost about 20 pounds and stopped losing weight. So we started this non-athlete lady uh, exercising. And uh, she exercises several times a week. And she's now losing weight, I think, at about uh, a half pound a week. and. She's uh, between five and 10 pounds above her ideal body weight. So she's lost a large percentage of her weight and is getting close to her ideal body weight. And the exercise uh, was the added uh, uh, key to further weight, weight loss after she leveled off uh, from the low carbohydrate diet. So exercise and low carbohydrate diets uh, are of great value. But lowering insulin resistance also ha helps because if you lower insulin resistance, you either make or inject less insulin, and insulin is a fat building hormone. So, uh, uh, in the book, we talk about using metformin and possibly other agents to help reduce insulin resistance. Um, my favorite is the metformin, uh, and um, uh, there are new p potential problems that have been discovered since the book that you have to check vitamin B12, homocysteine, and methylmalonic acid, uh, which are markers of B12 deficiency because metformin can interfere with the absorption of B12, and you might need a B12 supplement. But otherwise, it's pretty benign stuff. For some people, it causes diarrhea. Um, and I tend to avoid the other uh, drugs that uh, reduce insulin resistance, except as last resorts. Uh, here, another question. How many units of insulin per day is healthy? I think there's a very simple answer the number of units that it takes to normalize your blood sugar. And uh, whether you're making it or injecting it, whatever that turns out to be, that's what's healthy. Um, now, I should have qualified what I just said. I should have said the number of units that it takes to normalize your blood sugar on a low carbohydrate diet uh, uh, similar to the primitive diets that our ancestors had where they couldn't get uh, much in the way of carbohydrate and where they couldn't get any uh, simple sugars to speak of. So if you're on a low-carb diet, the amount of insulin you're going to need to keep your blood sugars normal is what's healthy.
Let's see. Ah. I've had type 1 diabetes for 27 years. I follow your protocols. My A1C is now 4.6. So this just reiterates what I keep saying. It can be done. Read the book. A routine eye exam showed moderate non-proliferative retinopathy, macular edema, and suspicious area of neovascularization. What is the possibility these conditions will re re be reversed if I maintain A1Cs around 4.6? How long might it take? Okay, my guess is that this person uh, has only recently come upon my book and recently lowered his A1C. Because if he had 4.6 for 27 years, he would not have any of these problems. Now... Uh, his question reminds me of a patient who was a very cooperative person and she was considered uncontrollable when I started treating her and she had macular edema. Uh, her uh, retinologist wanted to do laser treatments and I knew that laser treatments uh, could be very dangerous if used to treat macular edema, at least in those days. They're, they've learned how to be more cautious, how to use smaller doses, how to use different frequencies more recently. But in those days, um, you're asking for trouble if you use lasers for macular edema. And I asked the retinologist, I spoke to him on the phone, I said, give me six months. And we got her A1C under five. And six months later, she saw the retinologist. And he was so excited he had to call me. Uh, and he was in another state. Uh, he, he said, I've never seen this. I didn't know it was possible. Uh, she, her macular edema is gone. And that took six months. Now, how long does it take for proliferative retinopathy to go away. Um, I think it depends in part on how long you've had it, how severe it is. If you look at uh, these little vessels in proliferative retinopathy, there could be a spot of a cluster of tiny vessels, or it could encompass your whole eye and be a massive entangled mess. So it's highly variable. But the fact that this case of macular edema uh, vanished so rapidly, six months, I would encourage you and, and say that uh, your problems will go away in real time. How long, I don't know, but uh, just keep up, keep up with that 4.6. Okay, I think we finished our hour. Remember that our next uh, teleseminar will be on Wednesday, November 25, 2015. Thanks for listening, and uh, I look forward uh, to speaking to you again in a month.